Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all well. Um, it's a really important subject that we're going to look at this evening, that of the judgment to come. And perhaps if you have no prior knowledge or you haven't given this much thought before, um, you may have heard of perhaps the judgment or judgment day, but you may wonder what exactly it is. And maybe is it something to be feared? It does sound a little bit ominous, doesn't it? And well, hopefully through this evening, we'll think about um, judgment and the steps to judgment as well. I'm conscious of the certainly the direct audience that I know I'm speaking to this evening as well, though, those who will have looked at this before. And for those of you, I, I wonder how you feel about the judgment to come. Do you feel excited? Do you feel nervous? Do you feel joyful or petrified? Or maybe you feel a little bit of all of the above? Well, if we were to look in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5, we read in verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. <clears throat> Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. <clears throat> the word there, terror, is a Greek word that we find in the New Testament and that we have translated into English. The Greek word is phobos. It means fear. It's where we get phobia from, isn't it? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. So it does seem to be something that's a little bit scary. And yet in John's first letter in chapter four, he writes, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness, which means openness or confidence. We may have boldness in the day of judgment. And some of the last words that are written in the New Testament, um, the second letter to Timothy that Paul wrote in chapter four and verse eight, he speaks of his confidence where he says, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And let's not forget that in Luke 12, we read about it being our father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. We read, fear not, little flock, don't we? And so to stand before Christ, which we get from some of those verses there, to stand before Christ at judgment is an opportunity for us. I suppose it's a little bit like taking an exam or a driving test. We might be nervous about it. We're going to be understandably nervous about it because the result of that can change the direction of our lives. But it's an opportunity that we can have that we can take for good. I suppose at the end of the day, if uh, we're in school, we don't need to sit the exam. Um, but if we do sit the exam, then there's great opportunities opened up for us afterwards. <clears throat> so we talk about the judgment as being something that is to come. And we as Christadelphians believe that that judgment must be coming very soon. And we look at Bible prophecy and we see that the things that we are being told by what's happening in the world around us tells us that Christ is to return to the earth very soon and that he will judge the earth and he will judge individuals upon the earth. So what about those who are no longer alive? Have they missed the opportunity? Well, that means then we really have to think about two aspects this evening. We have to think about resurrection, first of all, the coming back to life from the dead and then judgment. So will you come with me, please, first of all, to the first letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and chapter four. Now, it's a very positive letter that Paul writes in the first century to the believers who were at Thessalonica. Um, but sadly, they were going through quite a difficult time. <clears throat> the, uh, the Roman authorities were not particularly pleasant to many of the population. Uh, we read that many had been persecuted and even died in chapter 2 and verse 14. <clears throat> we read there the first Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 14. For ye brethren became followers of the churches or the ecclesias of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they please not God and are contrary to all men. So when we come then into chapter four, having understood the background to this letter that Paul writes, that they have lost some of their 
family, some of their dear friends to trouble and difficulty and persecution. We come to verse 13 where Paul writes, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And we're talking there, of course, not just of a, a natural sleep, but of death. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep or proceed to go before, shall not go before those who are asleep. And scripture talks about death as being asleep for those who are true believers and followers of Christ, because it is like a sleep, a sleep where one will arise and wake up in the morning. Now, Paul doesn't mention judgment here in this passage because that's not the purpose of what he's writing just here. He's writing to give comfort that those who have died, those who are asleep, will be given due consideration at the appropriate time. And that resurrection we're being told then is to happen prior to those living, joining them with Christ at his return. Now, it seems to me to be quite an Eastern way of thinking that preeminence was a really important thing. And I don't think it's probably so much an issue to us in Western society um, to, to, they didn't want to be second to another person. That was important to those uh, in, in this sort of culture at this time. <clears throat> we think about Jesus' disciples. They argued, didn't they, about who should be the next leader. We read also about those striving for the best seat at the wedding feast that's mentioned in the gospel records. I don't think, as we say, we sort of claim that superiority in the same way. We don't desire that superiority um, it, it, as judgment or beyond. Um, but for them, I think Paul is reassuring them when he's writing this letter that nobody is losing out. The living are not gathered first, but both groups, living and dead, will align simultaneously for judgment. Uh, and, we, and we read in the second letter to Timothy in chapter four in verse one he says I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick which means the living the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom so those who are asleep those who are dead in Christ faithfully having lived a, a life in Christ will be raised to also see this opportunity at judgment or well, continuing in Thessalonians we read in verse 16, the Lord himself himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So there will be a shout. The shout is going to be voiced. And the word that's used there in the Greek for shout is as, as would be used of one who is waking a sleeper. So it's, it's hugely appropriate, as you can see. Uh, the Greek word um, keliusma. Um, so it's the word that's used by charioteers to horses. Uh, it's used by hunters for the hounds. Um, or it's, it's given as a signal from those in authority. So the master of a ship will shout to the rowers and soldiers will be shouted in this way by their commander. And so we, we read, and I'll just read for you some verses from John in chapter 5. Um, a similar scenario here, a similar shout being used. John chapter 5, verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself and to have given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. We will finish that verse, actually. They, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So that shout will be given and judgment will happen to those who have been dead and those who are still living. And those who are raised will be preserved, but in a mortal state, just like the living will be, 
because this will simply be the start of a transitional process of being, as scripture tells us in the first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15, raised in incorruption. The living and the dead will stand before Christ at the judgment seat and be given an answer. We also see in verse 16 that Christ is going to descend from heaven, a fulfilment of what we see in Acts chapter 1 or the end of the gospel records. We, we read in the four gospel accounts, don't we, of the life of Christ and his death and his resurrection. And then we move as we go into the Acts of the Apostles of Christ ascending up into heaven and his disciples being comforted at that time by the angelic presence saying that don't worry, he will so come in like manner as he has ascended into heaven. So we have the promise of the return of Christ. And this trump of God will sound as well. And if we look again at how we uh, can, can link in by the Septuagint version into the Old Testament, we see that it's the same word used as in Numbers chapter 10 and verses two and three. And this is going back to the law of Moses, but in Numbers chapter 10, we see trumpets being mentioned. And so this trump of God is going to be sounded at the last days when the dead in Christ will be raised um, and they will be raised to a life. Well, when we go back to Numbers 10 and verse 1, we can see that linguistic link. That in Numbers 10 verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to the at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And so they're not ram's horns, these trumpets, like is commonly used in this, uh, the time of the law of Moses. Um, but this is silver trumpets that are going to be used. And it's the same kind of trumpet. And those who are dead will be assembled together with those who are living. And it says that they're going to be caught up, which just actually means to be snatched away. So don't worry, we will not miss the judgment, whether living or dead. That's not going to happen. God wants to reward us. Or if not, if we are not deserving of that reward, then it's quite right and it's righteous that we and ensure a punishment is given to us. Enoch, Elijah, Philip are all examples of characters in the Bible who were snatched away miraculous, miraculously, miraculously, and therefore is a good illustration for us to see what is to come. And so who will be raised? Well, we read of the judgment seat just a handful of times in the Old Testament, and there is a big concentration of it in the early New Testament. And that's probably because it was a very familiar scene that the readers, the direct readers at that time could relate to. They could understand the context of these Roman courts, uh, these rulers that had been placed on the thrones of the different provinces and countries. Um, they'd been put there by the Romans to rule over these particular areas. And so the thought of a judgment seat was a clear and obvious picture to those who were living in the first century. If you come with me, please, to Romans chapter 14. So Paul writing to the Romans in the first century and chapter 14. <clears throat> we read in verse 10, Romans 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set up naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And so just taking this verse on its own. And we read there that all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And yet we need to dig a little deeper, don't we? We go back to the first chapter of this letter to the Romans and we understand what Paul means when he says we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Because Paul is not writing this letter to the whole world. He's writing to a particular group of faithful believers who were there in Rome. So in Paul's introduction, introductory comments, uh, to this letter, um, he says, Paul, servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. 
Then as we move down to verse 7, we read that this letter is given to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this letter is actually written to those who are called to be saints, and that's not everybody. Called to be holy is what it says in some versions. Called to be separate, to stand apart from the rest of the world. Now, a similar kind of thing happens um, in the second letter that Paul writes to the Corinthians. There's no need to turn there, just very briefly. The second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 10. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And yet again, we think about who the audience is that Paul's writing to. It's not the whole world. It's those believers who were there in the ecclesia in Corinth, those who knew the truth <clears throat> and the gospel record. So any who are called to be saints are those who will be standing at judgment and therefore those who will be raised from the dead. Now, if you come back with me to Isaiah and chapter 26, we did say that there's a big concentration in the New Testament. But if we go back to Isaiah in the Old Testament and chapter 26, we can also see a little bit of insight uh, from many years previous to this. See that scripture is consistent with itself in both the Old and the New Testaments. We come to Isaiah 26 and we read about different rulers um, that were there at the time. So verse 13, um, it says in verse 13 of Isaiah 26, O Lord our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. They, that is these other rulers that had this temporal authority, they are dead, they shall not live. They are deceased, they shall not rise. Therefore thou hast visited and destroyed them, and made all their memory to perish. And so it's confirmed for us in the Old Testament in Isaiah that there are those who are dead who will not rise again. It is not a resurrection for all. They have brought no glory to God, have they? It's not their fault. They've just not heard about the good news, the gospel message, and therefore there is nothing to judge them on. There is no reason for them to be resurrected and to stand before a judgment seat. So we've hopefully seen there so far that there will be a resurrection from the dead for those who are in the same kind of situation as the living, those who are called to be saints, those who have heard the good news, the gospel message, um, and they are the ones who will be judged. Once enlightened, once people have seen the light once people have had an understanding to some extent of this gospel message they then become responsible to respond as we've seen many in the world are unenlightened most of the population of the world do not know the truth they do not know about god in any kind of detail they do not know the bible and therefore they are not held responsible they live they die and then that's the end. They decay. But other people have heard the truth, the gospel message that we believe as Christadelphians we preach. And whether they have accepted that or not, they have heard that message. And judgment, therefore, is to come upon these. We can perhaps illustrate this with very young children. How obedient are young children to us? So if I said to my youngest, who is nine months old, if she's being noisy, if I asked her to be quiet, it's not reasonable, is it, for me to expect a response from her? She doesn't understand it. She, I can't expect her to respond in the way that I might like her to sometimes. But for the older two, who are four and six, if they're too noisy and I ask them to be quiet, I would expect a response. Now. I think they could give one of three responses. They can either say, yes, dad, and they can be quiet. They could say, no, dad, and carry on as they are, or they could ignore me. So it's one of those three. But being passive there isn't acceptable. As a parent, if you ask a child to do something and they understand and you get ignored for it, that's not acceptable. And this is the same then with God. 
he has opened to us, to certain people, the truth, an understanding of the gospel, the good news. And therefore, there can be no passiveness. There can be no ignoring. There has to be a positive response if we want to please God. And this point of understanding of the gospel is only known by the individual themselves and God. Nobody else knows. No one knows for certain um, at what point um, somebody has that understanding where they need to respond. There is no measurable criteria and therefore we need to be very careful and we need to be very sensitive with those who are trying to understand the gospel message. But we do also have a responsibility, don't we, to make sure that they are kept informed of what eventually needs to happen to embrace this hope that's given to them that we have as well. Will you come with me now, please, to Matthew in chapter 22? So back into the New Testament, Matthew chapter 22. And it's at the start of this chapter where Jesus speaks a parable. And this parable is very much in its original context written about the Jews. The Jews who were God's chosen people. And Jesus is presenting this parable of a marriage that's been prepared by a king for his son. So we'll read these first few verses. Verse two, the kingdom of heaven is like to a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. And they made light of it and went their ways, one to, the, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to the servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. So in Matthew 22, we read about this wedding feast, this great opportunity that was given initially to the Jews, and they did not want to go. They were not interested. They wandered off and they decided to do their own thing. They made light of it and they even persecuted and punished the prophets that were sent to them. And of course, they even killed Christ Jesus himself. They therefore were not worthy to enter in and to share that marriage feast. But whilst this was written initially to the Jews, we surely see the same is there for us as well. That we have therefore been called to this marriage feast as well, a joyful occasion. But it's up to us to make sure that we respond in the appropriate way. We don't make light of it. We don't refuse to go, but we embrace it and we go to that wedding feast with the right attitude. <clears throat> so this is mirrored for us today because there can only be two outcomes of this judgment. Scripture is very clear throughout on polarizing a separation that is demanded of us. And so there are the sheep and the goats, as we'll see in a moment. There is the spirit and flesh. There's vessels to honour and vessels to dishonour. There's life, death. There's the narrow way, the broad way. There's God and mammon. There's the righteous, the ungodly in Psalm 1. And in a sense, the judgment that we will face when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ will be an answer to what the defendant wants. Has the defendant shown that they want the things of God? Are they serious about the things of God or do they want the things of the world, the things that please themselves? We read in Matthew 13 of the wheat and the tares growing together, awaiting the great threshing when at that point they will be separated. They're allowed to grow together, the good and the bad, until the end when judgment will come. And Daniel in chapter 12 and verse 2, we read, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, so again those who are dead, many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there's two possible outcomes. The righteous will be given eternal life. And it's not time for us tonight to think about what that really means to have eternal life and to enter into the kingdom of God. But the unrighteous will be rewarded with shame and death. 
and only those who've accepted the call and been faithful will be given eternal life. Those who've accepted the call and not been faithful will end with death. And those who have heard and understood but not accepted the call have made no commitment to the Father and therefore there is only one outcome for them as well. Well turn with me over a few pages please to Matthew in chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 and we've had these verses read for us um, in our introductory reading. <clears throat> but we see that the Son of Man in verse 31 is going to come in his glory, the holy angels with him. And in verse 32, he's going to gather all nations or perhaps that's from all nations. And he's going to separate one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he's going to put the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. Then in verse 34, then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. And what's happened is that these who are regarded as being sheep have lived with one another in caring for one another. Because they say, well, when have we done this? And the king says to them, well, you've done it to each other and therefore in doing it to each other, you've done it to me. They've lived a godly life. They've reflected the character of God in the way that they were living and therefore they are given this answer of peace. But that's not the same then for the goats. In verse 45, we come to the end of this passage. He answers those saying, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And so there is this clear separation of the sheep and the goats, the good and the bad, the righteous and the unrighteous. In a moment, we'll come to think about the sheep and the goats and what they are, what they look like in nature, um, in real life and see the lessons from them. But we'll just um, for a moment go back to uh, Romans chapter 14 and we've been to Romans 14 once already but we'll read on a little bit in Romans 14. We, we went in at verse 10 before Romans 14 verse 10 where we said for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we recognise that that was all who are called to be holy separate. 4 in verse 11 for it is written as I live saith the Lord Every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And so there will be this time where we will have to give account of ourselves. If we've been called to be holy, we must give account of ourselves to God. We perhaps think to the parable in Luke chapter 19 of the pounds being given to those servants and whether they were able to do anything with those pounds. And they have to give an account of what they've done with that money when the master returns. Now for those who are accepted, those sins will not be mentioned. In Matthew 25 and in verse 21, it said, well done thou good and faithful servant. Come ye blessed of my father, in verse 34. And in verse 40, inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me as well. So there will just be positives to those who are accepted, to those who are righteous. Actually, if you come back to the Old Testament and to Ezekiel in chapter 18, <clears throat> we can see that this is mentioned as the case here as well. That if that answer of peace is given, those things that we have done wrong in the past will not be mentioned anyway. We all fail. None of us will get things perfect. None of us will get things right. But it's a good character and it's a right spirit that we approach these things in that Christ wants to see when he comes to judge. <clears throat> so in, in Ezekiel chapter 18, we see in verse 20 or verse 19, even this, this section begins. And it's a section about um, the, the iniquity or the, the guilt of the father being passed on to the son and other, other family members. Um, 
it says in verse 19, yet ye say, verse 19, why doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right and hath kept all my statutes and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall not die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So we shall all stand and give an account before the judgment seat of Christ. When we go down to verse 21, then, if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. And so it's that great positive that's going to be recounted to him at the judgment seat. There's no need to mention those things that have gone wrong in the past. We know from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23 that God is the judge of all, but authority has been given to his son, to Christ. We've mentioned John chapter 5 and verse 22 already. For the father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the son. And verse 27, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the son of man. So this is God who is the judge, and yet the authority has been given to Christ at his return that we've already mentioned. Well, we said in Matthew 25 that those who stand before judgment will be separated into the sheep and the goats two animals particularly to the majority of us probably who look very similar from a distance but they've got very different characteristics and this is where we think about the wheat and the tares again they both grow together it's hard to distinguish between the two the wheat and the tares until they're actually harvested this is what i found about goats i'm going to quote this uh, i think it was uh, jim cowie that's mentioned this but is, is quoted on Lots of different websites. Goats are capricious. They're impulsive and unpredictable, devious and contrary. When they are grazing, it's not unusual to see several with their heads through a fence, straining to reach the grass that is always greener on the other side. If they're not poking their heads through fences, they may be standing on their hind legs, stretching for those tender leaves just out of reach. Goats are never content with what they have. In contrast to this, we have some passages on sheep and we're not going to turn them up. But if you want to write them down, then please feel free. I'll, uh, I'll read out the quotes um, briefly to you and we'll see sheep aren't perfect. But in John chapter 10 and verse 27, sheep are attentive. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, we read that sheep are responsive. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Which takes us then to Psalm 23 and verse 2. They are willingly led. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Sheep do occasionally stray. In Isaiah 53 and verse 6 we read, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But sheep are submissive. That next verse in Isaiah 53, verse 7. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And so we see these two different animals that, as we said, seem quite similar to us from a distance. But actually, they are very different and they need to be judged. It is right it is righteous that they are judged in this way well the result for the rejected and we remember that we're told that many are called few are chosen the rejected will witness the saints with christ they will be absolutely joyful beyond words those who are the saints who are entering into the kingdom with christ and they will then move on together to execute judgments upon the nations while those who've been rejected will stand watching, wailing and gnashing their teeth. What will their end be? Well, it will be confusion, 
misery, loneliness in a doomed world of self-destruction and extreme lawlessness. We remember the complaint of the rejected in Matthew 7 verse 22. I never knew you is what they'll be told. But for the righteous, there will be an instant change then to immortality. If you finally come back with me, please, to Exodus in chapter 40. We can see how the household of God is being constructed. It is being prepared at the moment. Those who are called to be saints, called to be holy, are the household of God, a spiritual house. We are preparing ourselves to become a much more permanent, a much more perfect spiritual house at the return of Christ when we hope to live with him in the kingdom. And we can see a little foreshadowing of this under the law when we come to Exodus chapter 40. And the few chapters before this has been years of preparation, of planning, of gathering, of processing of individual materials. And now we come into Exodus chapter 40 and look what happens. Verse one, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying on the first day of the first month, shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. The tent is going to be immediately then erected after those years of trial, of trouble, of preparation, those years that we go through now. And then Christ will return and suddenly immortality will be given. And there will be a time to celebrate the wedding of all weddings that's described to us in Revelation, a time like no other of joy, love, peace and celebration of God being glorified in the earth. We have a hope to be there in that day and it's up to us now then whether we choose to take that opportunity and devote ourselves to God. Thank you for listening.